Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Vassal Pavel Library. My name is Michael Zantowski. And it is my great uh, pleasure to welcome a special guest uh, uh, to the library, Professor Grzegorz Jekiel, uh, the head of the Center for European Studies at Harvard University, a uh, man who two years ago fascinated me with uh, his uh, presentation about the uh, historical roots of some of the uh, current uh, issues in uh, Central European uh, politics and in geopolitics uh, in, uh, in general, and uh, he's visiting Prague, so we were, we were uh, lucky enough to, uh, to get him to the library and uh, check us without uh, any further ado, the, the floor is yours. And
just to give you the one example of this way of thinking, this is a quotation from Robert Putnam, uh, uh, a political scientist from my department and a colleague um, from the book on, uh, on democracy, where he makes this point. Uh, we should not expect anything spectacular in this uh, Those countries are going to be like Metro Giorno, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, clientelism and lawlessness, ineffective governments, uh, economic stagnation. Palermo is going to be the future of uh, uh, of uh, uh, region um, and uh, the future of Moscow. So that was the view, and this was the consensus. No one really expects that something can work very fast. And of course, you know, 25 years forward, and there is a very interesting story developing uh, in the region. Uh, so, you know, what are the outcomes of the transition after 25 years? And I think we can summarize this in, in the following five points. And I will show you along the way some empirical illustrations uh, of those four arguments. So, we have first of all the extraordinary diversity of outcomes. There is no more diversified region in the world today than the former communist countries. You have everything here from consolidated liberal democracy, and you do have the Czech Republic, to completely bizarre authoritarian regimes in Central Asia. Uh, and you have everything in between. The authoritarians in Russia, uh, some sort of you know instability, political instability, as we do have in Ukraine, and so on and so forth. So that's the first one. Now the second one is the geographic distribution of those outcomes. There are very specific geographic lines uh, which divide the region uh, today. Uh, then I will say something about uh, about the path of developments for countries of different parts of the former Soviet bloc. And, uh, so that's, that's you know, how I will proceed for another uh, few moments uh, talking about this uh, diversity of uh, outcomes. So, first, speaking about democracy, that graph is a uh, graph from uh, Freedom House, uh, the big American foundation, uh, which is uh, tracing the quality of democracy around the world. So every year, Freedom House is rating all the countries in the world uh, on a variety of criteria, and then gives the scores uh, 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 showing how good the quality of democracy is in the specific country, or how bad the authoritarian regime is in another country. So when you look at the last 25 years, uh, and you look at the four regions of, of, the, of the former Soviet bloc, uh, uh, this one is the East Central Europe, mainly uh, the four Michigan Grand countries plus the Baltic Republic and Slovenia. The other graph uh, line describes the countries of the Baltics, uh, all the uh, <coughs> former republics of, of Yugoslavia and Albania. This describes uh, what is the core of the, of the Soviet Union, um, so Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia itself. Uh, and this uh, graph uh, is Central Asia, uh, and, and the other one, uh, I forget, is uh, the main economic standards in the world. So, the moment the transition happened, uh, you see how different is those regions probably politically. There was this incredibly fast consolidation of newly emerging democracy and, and the securing of uh, political and uh, and human rights in Central Europe, those countries in a very short period of time, in a matter of six, seven years, had the quality of democracy in a par with Southern Europe and Western. Those places, according to freedoms, made tremendous progress. They became the established, consolidated democracies very fast. You know, other places, as you see, uh, were not making so much progress initially, and then stayed uh, on much
children left, right? So, you know, the Balkans is going to be struggling with establishing the rule of law and democracy for uh, since, you know, 89 until today. Uh, Russia has descended into a quite nasty authoritarian regime. Uh, you know, Central Asia never pretended to have any sort of democracy, right? So this was the political story of the transition. Now, the economic story of the transition was very simple. Uh, some countries made tremendous progress economically. So look at Poland. Uh, you know, the Poland GDP per capita quadrupled over the last 25 years. Poland was one of the top six fastest growing economies uh, in the last 22 or 23 years in the world. Uh, and of course, uh, Poland did not experience any recession during the big troubles in the, uh, uh, of the euro crisis, uh, which we are living through now. Now, for that matter, look at the Ukraine. Uh, this is a very good comparison, because at the starting point of the transition, Ukraine and Poland 20 something years ago were very close to one another in terms of you know, uh, how rich those countries were, the GDP per capita, the industrial potential, and so on, and look uh, where uh, Ukraine is today and how much progress Poland made. Uh, again, you know, countries like Slovenia, Czech Republic, and Slovak Republic made tremendous progress over, over the last 25 years. And again, the similar story can be told about the quality of governments. This is the World Bank uh, set of data, indicators about you know, how good the states are in the world in, in governing uh, their respective societies. And of course, you know, there is a similar story, right? So this is a central uh, uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, these are the Balkans, somewhere in the middle, and that countries are the, the former Soviet Union countries, except, except for, uh, for uh, the Republic of Republics, right? So, so we see that whatever data we look at, Suddenly, we see those distinctions emerging in, uh, in the region. Um, and those distinctions display a very specific geographic pattern. Now, when you look at the map, uh, this is again Freedom House map uh, with all those ratings of democracy. But when you look at the distribution of economic outcomes, it's pretty much the same picture. You have division, first of all, west and east. The farther the country is to the west, the better the country became, both politically, economically, and socially. The farther the country to the east, you can expect authoritarian system, you can expect very dysfunctional economy, you can expect a lot of corruption, and so on. And that was an expected division, right? That was a division which we knew existed all along. But what emerged over the last 15 years or so is the division between the North and South. When someone asked an expert on Eastern Europe in 1988 a question, what would be the most successful countries in the region if the communist system was. The answer would be very simple. Yugoslavia and Hungary. Now, Yugoslavia is here as a very unfortunate part of the, of the former Soviet bloc. And Poland and Baltic republics are belonging to the northern world. I made this point uh, uh, a year ago or so when the Polish foreign, former Polish foreign minister said, now they tell in Brussels that Poland is the northern And this is the biggest compliment one could make uh, 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 for a poll. Uh, so we have this division between west and east and north and south. And this division is becoming uh, uh, very well established and very well entrenched. Now, the other thing which I wanted to mention is, uh, uh, is the story about uh, the, the circles, vicious circles of transformation. 
the evidence from history tells us that all good things go together and all bad things go together. You don't have a good democracy in Eastern Europe with terrible economic performance. And you don't have an authoritarian regime in Eastern Europe with good economic performance. But theoretically, it would be possible right, to have a nasty political regime which have decent economic policies. And China is trying to do something like that. Right? We'll see how far this goes. Uh, I'm uh, pessimistic on that. But evidence from Eastern Europe tells us uh, uh, this story. So if you measure the economic transition on this dimension, and you measure the political transition in this dimension, you see that the most successful countries are both good democracies and working market economies. All the bad countries are deep, right? So again, good things and bad things tend to go together. But the big part of the transition is uh, the following. One could imagine that over a period of a quarter of a century, with so much attention, so much money, so much help, so much advice going to those countries in the region, they should make some sort of progress and converge in one way or another. Now, if you look at the region over this period of time, like looking at the scores of democracy, and you see the parallel lines going on. Those countries are not moving up, becoming similar to those countries. Those countries are not moving much down either, right? So you see a trajectory which sort of moves in parallel ways uh, across time without countries changing in very dramatic way their position over time. This is another German foundation which does similar things to uh, Freedom House, measures progress of democracy and political reforms and economic reforms across the region. And you see pretty much the same features. Our, our four regions are moving uh, on straight lines. Now, electoral process. I mean, this is easy. We know how to fix elections. Electoral law is not complicated things. But even in this very simple domain, there is no convergence of any kind. <coughs> Governance, the same story. NGO. Same story, civil society, uh, corruption, the same story, independent media, the same story, right? So there is something very peculiar going on uh, with the lack of convergence over the uh, seven uh, period. So that's, these are the outcomes of the transition, which I think are very interesting and very positive for, uh, for many. Social scientists uh, 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 to really figure out how should we think about this and how should we uh, explain that. Now, let me now move to the lessons of, of the transition. What have we learned? What is the consensus among social scientists about, uh, about you know, what are the most beneficial strategies and ways of, of uh, 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 moving away from the countries? Uh, so, the first issue uh, I wanted to is the fact that historical endowments of those specific countries matter a great deal. <coughs> and it's fascinating that despite all the opportunities, the countries which started at a certain level are at a certain level today. So the richest, the most developed countries in communist Europe are today the richest and most developed countries of post-communist Europe. <coughs> right? And those traditional divisions tend to persist over time. And I want to make a very short uh, uh, historical footnote 
to show you uh, a, a, a quick story about the power of, of historical legacies, uh, which is very lasting. And uh, I'm sorry, I have seen that uh, in a set of uh, slides uh, before, uh, but he's happy to see it uh, once more. Now, Andrew Janos is a, a, a prominent uh, Berkeley political uh, scientist who spent a lot of time studying uh, Eastern Europe, uh, mostly Hungary, and he had this long historical view of developments, uh, and he started his book on, uh, on the develop economic developments in, in uh, Hungary over the period of 100 years with this uh, old French uh, proverb uh, that, uh, you know, regardless how you how you uh, change the things, they tend to uh, stay the same. And then, and then, okay, so here's the story, right? This is a map of Poland, uh, and this is a, a, a presidential election in 2005 in Poland. Uh, at that time, Kaczynski and uh, uh, Tusk were the two uh, candidates. Uh, and then one thing you see here is that in this part of Poland, uh, uh, Tusk uh, had the advantage uh, in elections, and in this kind of Poland, uh, uh, Kaczynski had now, these are the parliamentary elections uh, uh, which follow two years uh, after the presidential election. And again, you know, you see this kind of division of Poland between sort of the uh, 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 civic platform and uh, the law and justice uh, part. We move forward. Uh, these are European, the last European election. So you see the same thing. This is the latest presidential election in Poland between uh, the East of Komorowski and Andrew Duda. You see the same thing. Uh, this is 2015 uh, parliamentary election. Uh, you see the same thing. Okay, so what is the line which divides Poland uh, into uh, those two uh, politically different uh, camps with very different uh, political preferences? Now, you go back to 1871, uh, Poland, of course, at that time uh, was not an independent state, and was divided between German, Russian, and Austro Hungarian Empire. And here is the border between Russian Empire and German Empire. Uh, so when you impose the border from the 19th century on electoral preferences uh, in Poland today, here you see. Now, in the meantime, you know, this is over 100 years uh, since the border disappeared because Poland emerged as an independent state, then moved uh, through uh, a gigantic war, imposition of communist rule, and all those other things happened along the way, and suddenly, uh, after so many years, it's the border. But it's not only about electoral preferences, it's about other things as well. Right, so this is support for European integration, and we see pretty much the same division. This is a distribution of non-governmental organizations in the countryside. Right? You have a lot of NGOs in this part of Poland, and you have uh, relatively few NGOs in that part of Poland. It's not only about the density of NGOs, but also about the kind of NGOs you have. So in this part of Poland, the most important NGO are the voluntary fire brigades. While in this part of Poland, uh, there, are, there are different uh, uh, organizations. And even this, you know, this is, this is pretty funny. Right? As you know, uh, people taking credits in Swiss francs uh, are the big problem uh, for some countries, like uh, Poland and, and Hungary, and you see, the same distribution. In one part, people tended to take loans in Swiss France, and in another part, uh, they didn't. So, the point is really that there are long standing historical legacies uh, which are affecting the present day outcomes. And I say you can see that in uh, economic dimension. You know, the countries, the ranking of countries as a GDP per capita over the last 100 years in the region didn't change. There's always Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic as the richest, most developed country, then it was Hungary, then Poland, then Romania, then Bulgaria, right? So that was the ranking, and that ranking persists. So there is some historical uh, tendency, trajectory there. There's historical tendency and trajectory in political preferences. And today, 
say, when you look at the language of peace party in Copenhagen, this is exactly the same language the communists used, I was telling uh, uh, Martin in 1968, uh, during the anti-Semitic anti-intellectual campaigns in Berlin, and this is the same language the radical nationalist organizations used in Poland in the 1930s. So this persists uh, in, uh, in uh, quite significant. Now the second lesson of that mission uh, is that dispersion of political power through institutions is the key for success. There is not a single presidential democracy which retain democracy in the Polish region. All the countries which became decent democracies are parliamentary democracies. Uh, all the countries which have uh, better economic performance are the countries which have independent central banks, uh, and so on and so on. So the more you disperse the power among various institutions, the more veto points you have within the political system and within the economic system you may expect better results. So the idea that you need to concentrate power in one person's hands to move things along is very bad. Then you end up like Russia. And China is moving very quickly in this direction. So that's, that's the second lesson uh, which comes from the region. Now the third lesson is that your location on the map matters. And of course, the closer to Western Europe you are, the better off you are. Because of the diffusion, because of the exchanges, because of all the other things which, uh, uh, which facilitate the exchange of ideas, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, and so on. Uh, the fourth lesson of the transition is that if you were democracy at a certain point in the past, this guy's. And again, you know, this is one of those things which you don't know exactly why this happens. Uh, but all the countries which have decent democracies today in the region are the countries which had democratic experience at one time in their history before. So it seems that building democracy the second time uh, is easier than building democracy. <coughs> And it's interesting that if you look at institutions, uh, those countries which had parliaments before uh, have the same parliaments today. Those parliaments have the same names. Uh, they even have the same number of deputies as they did in the 1930s uh, and so on. So, uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is uh, an interesting story. Now, the fifth lesson is that uh, welfare policies and social safety nets matter. The countries which are better off today are countries which spend approximately three times more on welfare than the countries which are not. So the spending in Central Europe is around 30% of GDP on all the social welfare programs. The spending on welfare in Central Asia, Russia, and other places is in single digits. Right? So it's a big gap, big difference uh, uh, between, uh, between them. Uh, and that final uh, lesson of the transition is the state. So democracy is not only about political regime, it's not about position, uh, it's not about choice. It's also about a competent state, uh, about competent bureaucracies, uh, accountable state, about judiciary, and so on and so on. Right? So the countries which were uh, able to reform the states inherited from the coming period are doing much better than uh, the countries which uh, are not able to do. Uh, okay, so, so these are the lessons, and now we face the biggest puzzle, of course,
this is completely an expected outcome. Uh, you know, I never thought again uh, that I was worried about politics in Poland. I left Poland after martial law. Uh, I was involved in funding the solidarity uh, movement in many different ways. Uh, I proudly wore the solidarity logo, which then I put aside when the solidarity trade union became a nasty legal organization after uh, 89. But today I wear the co-op sign, you know, the Committee in Defense of Democracy, which is the second largest social movement in defense of democracy in Europe under solidarity was in 1980. Right? So that's something which I uh, never expected uh, to happen again. And this is this is really critical and, and, and possible. Now first, what are the uh, what is the evidence of, of the of the backsliding? And I think uh, I, I think this is uh, this is quite obvious. So again going back to the transition uh, to the to the penal house uh, ratings um, you see that uh, Central Europe, the quality of democracy has been the same <coughs> since 2004. Right? So there is something uh, really going <coughs> on that those countries are losing the quality of democracy. Of course, the Euro Asia with Russia itself slides yet even faster. The Balkans, which were making some slight progress over the last 10 years or so, are at the starting point uh, again. So that's, that's the story of, of politics, that's the story of, of democracy. Uh, it's the similar story of economic reforms. Uh, those economic reforms stagnated uh, across the board, as you see again, you know, around 2004, suddenly those lines are starting to go flat. What is even more worrisome is that <coughs> the stagnation and the backsliding in economic dimension is bigger in the member state of the European Union. But here you have uh, this uh, bigger... Uh, uh, so we have backsliding both in political dimension and in economic dimension. And what goes with it as well uh, is the decline in trust in markets. So this is, a, this is a survey done by EDRD in 2006 and 2010, and you see that those uh, blue lines uh, is the latest survey showing quite dramatic decline in the trust in the market economy, especially in the countries right, which enjoyed so much progress uh, having those market economies established after so many years of uh, century. Uh, so, okay, so what is going on uh, in our parts of the world and why uh, we see things moving uh, uh, in this direction? Of course, none of those will happen without the crisis of the European Union. Now, I will briefly run through all the dimensions of the crisis, and I, and I think the European project is in the grave danger. Church 
changed in some dramatic way. Of course, it did a little bit. Right? It moved the world of several dimensions to duration. But if not for John Paul II, who was really very forceful for European integration, the Polish church would have been opposed to it even in 2001. Uh, so, so this has something to do with the crisis of the European Union. And that crisis of the European Union is a very complicated affair. Never one could expect that this developed state. So it started with the the bankruptcy of Greece, uh, with all the problems in uh, Southern Europe, and suddenly it exposed the weaknesses of the, of the Euro uh, zone and, 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 and currency, uh, which people were aware of. Uh, this is not the story that no one could make the decision about the introduction of Europe. They didn't know that, uh, that, that there are potential dangers there, uh, but they were ignored. Conveniently ignored, uh, people were hoping that this economic moment uh, would last. So, the first one was the tremendous economic crisis, and mind you, we are still with it, especially in southern Europe and in many places in Western Europe. Right? There is no economic growth in Western Europe. The only places that are growing are countries of the, of the United States, not all, but at least uh, some. Uh, so, you know, it's there is a lot of patching up done, but there is no really a serious uh, fundamental solution to any of the fundamental uh, problems of the uh, of the Eurozone. Now, the second uh, uh, blow uh, was uh, produced by this man. Now, it is the first time since the Second War where the one European country attacks another European country, annex the territories of another country. This is absolutely unbelievable. In violation of all the treaties uh, which come to your mind. You know, the European Union was based on the idea that the prevention of war is the most important thing we can do in Europe. And suddenly, all those ideas about coexistence and, uh, and the stable borders have been denied. Right? So this created a tremendous geopolitical problem for Europe uh, and confronted Europe with a set of decisions which were very difficult, very difficult uh, to make. And of course, those things are still with us. And what adds to it, of course, are the wars in the neighborhood. You know, the Middle East and North Africa are in flames. These are terrible, vicious wars from there, where innocent people are slaughtered. Um, and the EU is watching that developing. Right? Now, let me say we cannot do anything about this. We have no instruments of any kind. This is too big for anyone uh, to, uh, to solve. Uh, one could say, well, you know, we should have intervened much uh, 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 earlier and in a much more powerful way. We should extend the Marshall Plan to Middle East and North Africa just to keep some uh, elements of economic prosperity over there and so on. So, you know, it's a serious, it's a serious issue. You cannot have a stable region which is surrounded by the wars. I mean, this is, this is unbelievable. Think, think about this five years ago. Would Evan predicted that you will have Russia bombing, you know, one set of rebels, Americans bombing, another set of rebels, and NATO planes shooting down the Russian plane. I mean, you know, this <coughs> the, the most outrageous science fiction story would be like that. But we've been living through that uh, through the science fiction. Of course, you know, what follows uh, is the huge <coughs> And rightly so, you know, there are ex that are really escaping uh, the wars and poverty. Right? You know, we can make a question, you know, who is a better refugee, uh, those who uh, is about to be killed by, uh, by Islamic uh, radicals, or those who is about to die from starvation.
regulation, uh, you know, this is a this is a good discussion, right? Because among those people you have both. Right? Uh, so we have the huge refugee crisis, and of course this huge refugee crisis uh, is producing the rise of far right radical movements uh, uh, across Europe, everywhere. So when you think about support for right wing political parties in Europe, in 95, you know, this is the percentage of you know how much support is parties. So the darker color is when the support for right wing parties is reaching over 30%. Right? So in 1995, well, you know, Berlusconi was the only bad guy uh, uh, in Europe and uh, Zoom forward to 2015, and you see that Europe has changed colors in a very dramatic uh, and very uh, substantial way. Not only that, but keep in mind that these are not a decent right wing Christian democratic parties we used to have. These are very radical parties. These are very often extremist parties. Think about Yogic in Hungary. These are real fascists. This is this is not uh, sort of you know a little bit more radical uh, right. They are marching in uniforms with torches and so on, right? having head shaved. This is really scary. Let's take you back. You know, we watched the rallies in Nuremberg in the 1930s. That's what it is, right? Uh, uh, so. That's what is going on in this video. But then finally, uh, I think uh, uh, what needs to be emphasized is that <laughs> the legitimacy of the European Union is in danger. When the biggest countries, the most important countries, are contemplating exiting the Union. When biggest funding members are flanking the rules <coughs> of Jerusalem, when most fundamental ideas about freedom movement and others are questioned, when the borders are reimposed, I mean, this is about Trump. Now, moreover, the European Parliament is the only parliament with anti systemic minority. You know, anti-systemic minorities in pre-war Europe were destroying democracy, right? These were fascist and communists in, in the parliaments of democratic countries. Today, 25% of the members of the EU parliament are there to destroy the European Union. That's what it is. Uh, so, there is a lot of problems, and this crisis is becoming bigger and bigger with every passing year and more and more difficult to control. I don't even want to think what's going to happen a week from now when the Brits decide to get out. This will create another level of problems and insecurities and answers, uh, which may well uh, you know, uh, have a very serious consequences. OK, but we have our own bracket of problems on the top of all other problems. Now, okay, so now we have in power in two countries, two nationalistic right-wing governments, which do the number of things uh, which previous governments didn't do. So first of all, they promote ethno-nationalist and uh, culturally conservative concept of political. They divide the societies between those who are good Poles and terrible Poles. The first class citizens who support nationalist and peace causes, and the second class citizens who are supporting gay rights and, uh, and all those other Western uh, imports uh, the real Polish Catholic should, uh, should reject uh, out there. Uh, so that's the, the first one. It's the fundamental thing. How do you define political community? Which is the underlying thing of a democratic society. Who is included? Who is excluded? Right? In liberal democracy, we define this community in 
way in their own way, trying to injure the other one. They are doing the other thing. But they are trying to exclude the Islamist enemy, right? Uh, they don't, uh, they don't like Now, they push you a populist economic policies. The key idea is to reverse the privatization process, renationalize the economy. Jaroslav Kaczynski, a couple of days ago, at a very important forum in Poland, said, Poland needs economic sovereignty. We will have to fight for economic sovereignty for Poland. That means making as much problems for foreign corporations, European corporations, uh, as possible to force them to either withdraw from Poland uh, or uh, stop investing uh, in Poland, non bank things in Poland. The new, uh, uh, the new law which is just a few weeks ago about the selling of land, uh, makes purchase of land for anyone but Polish citizen and not everyone Polish citizen impossible. This is a Polish land and it should not matter in the German hands. So this, is, this is the way of thinking of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, of this land. Of course, they are dispensing the benefits uh, uh, for which they have no resources they cannot afford. Uh, every child in Poland is getting 500 zlotys today, and this creates a gap in the, in the Polish budget. And a few more promises of lowering the uh, uh, time manager now, which is not really uh, uh, future economy. Now, the third thing they do, they stir up the under EU figures. Uh, they attack uh, the EU, EU authorities, they attack EU leaders in statements that you know, stupid uh, vice chair of the European Commission should keep things for themselves instead of criticizing our sovereign uh, government. And you know the Polish the Polish uh, 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 spokesman for the president uh, of Poland uh, probably says that our country is now run by politicians accountable to Polish voters, not to German, British or French. Uh, left wing intellectuals. But that's 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 the way of thinking about it. Now the first target of attack were the constitution. This was done by uh, Urban in Hungary first, and now uh, it's in full speed uh, in Poland. Now the, Poland, the institutional courts in Eastern Europe, the merger over the last 25 years, has a very important defender of rights. Uh, they were important veto players uh, in, uh, in those countries. So in order to force uh, uh, new legislation, they need to be neutralized. And this is done with great precision. So the new law on, uh, on constitutional uh, court in Poland changed the nomination process for the judges so that it's the part of the court with its own Loyalists, uh, it uh, changes the, the, the majority decision rules. So now you need to have two third majority in order to, to uh, you know, question the, uh, the, the law. Uh, of course, when the, when the court part with few more pieces loyalists, you will never have two third majority to question the law, and so on and so on. I, I will not go into this. Now, the second line of attack, I mean, yeah. so it's wholesale takeover of public media by the peace, all the independent institutions are dissolved, uh, new uh, boards are established everywhere, uh, every newspaper, uh, radio station, TV station which is public is packed by the, uh, by the loyalists uh, from, uh, from peace uh, at this point. And of course this is also applied to the public, to the public uh, uh, sector in the economy. Uh, so now, a couple years into the process of takeover. Uh, the boards of all the companies, the management of all the public companies has changed. All those new board members, all those new uh, managers are the peace loyalists. Uh, they have no qualification to run those big companies. You know, when, when peace, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful story, you know, just to give you one example. So, so Poland has a little tradition of, of raising horses. And there are these, these beautiful uh, uh, places which produce the highest quality horses in the world, which are bought by Americans and Arabs, you know, who pay a little amount of money for those horses. Now, those two uh, places were run for the last 30 years by incredibly 
who never had anything to do with horses. So when, when, the, when the journalist asked him, okay, so what are your qualifications to run those two very special places? He said, I always liked horses. <laughs> that, that, was, that was the qualification for, uh, for becoming the manager. Right. So, you know, that strategy, of course, was invented by this man. But peace and power is following this with much greater speed and much greater uh, determination. Uh, so, uh, well, let me say one thing more uh, on, on the specific uh, uh, ideas uh, coming from, from this kind of thing. The refugee crisis created another world. Uh, to say no to any involvement in solving the refugee problem uh, in, uh, in Eastern and, and here, you know, you have the people who are saying things like, you know, the refugees bring dangerous diseases, uh, they will uh, destroy uh, our society by bringing in terrorists and so on, and here is your bank of four, uh, which is supposed to create the block against process in, in uh, serving, uh, uh, solving uh, uh, many other uh, problems. Now, this man came out with a completely new idea of creating a block that we should have uh, countries by you know, spanning from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, and he wants this block to be to the people, everything uh, uh, which he will be uh, is uh, trying to do. So that's kind of, you know, the Central European phase uh, of the, the revolution uh, which is going mm -hmm. on. And I call this revolution because this is indeed the revolution from above. This is the way the Bolsheviks uh, were active, those men, uh, they were the community and, and uh, the government uh, were uh, proceeding the following way. Now, okay, what are the causes of this? The classic <coughs> example of argument is that the so-called transition users, all the social groups which lost in the last 25 years, uh, were finally get out of the making the class. And when you start asking people what they think about their situation, what they think about uh, progress they make, what they think about their jobs and other things, Surprisingly, they're pretty happy. You know, they know how much progress has been made over the last 25 years in any possible direction. <coughs> any possible dimension. And I will show you something in this. So, so these are not the transition losers who are voting those nationalists. This is the revolution of the provincial elites. One would say that these are the losers of the European elite integration. These are people who never benefited from elite integration. Don't know languages, uh, who don't have skills, never studied in Western universities, don't have degrees from Harvard Business School and from Oxford, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, these are people who don't like what happened in poverty and in other countries. Right? And I always give that example who is the man who doesn't know a single language, who didn't travel, he maybe left Poland twice when he was the Prime Minister for two years and uh, didn't like it. This is the man who never read the foreign newspaper. This is the man who never saw the foreign television. This is the man who doesn't have a bank account. This is the man who doesn't drive. And he's alone. Should they 
wear the white socks or black socks, that's very easy. It's very easy to learn what you know cultural people should consume, right? You know, sushi and all those other things. Now that comes quickly, right? So you see that artificial modernization across Central and Eastern Europe. You know, they all dress the same. Uh, you will never recognize whether the person on the street is Italian or Pole or Czech and so on. They go to those same sushi places. They like the same cocktails and, uh, and French wines and all those other things. And they learn that things they should say, right? Uh, you know, what, what decent European should say. But the moment they have a couple of glasses of the, of the French wine and they start talking, suddenly they discover that, you know, this is just, you know, on the surface. They are very different. They don't believe in what they say, right? They have very different ideas. Now, that's what I mean, that there is this disparity between how quickly you can change in the artificial way the way you dress and how much time this takes for your cultural ideas and values to be changed. And now we have this big gap developing, right? That, you know, they look like Europeans. You look at Orban and he's, you know, well-dressed European leader. He opens his mouth and he is a, a provincial Hungarian uh, politician. You know, that's where the problem is. Now, the second problem, uh, of course, is that uh, I call this the banality of the world order. And, 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 and you know, what I mean by this is um, those societies in Eastern Europe had tremendous collective projects over the last 20 something years. First was to uh, fight the communism, then to build democracy, then to build market economy. Then to get to the European Union, this was tremendous effort, uh, and some people disagree with this and that. But there was consensus on this. Right? These were like the national struggles for joining Europe. And then what happened was, you know, after 2004, these people said, "All right, you've done it. Enjoy." And you see, this especially among young. There is no analytic project. There is no new set of ideas you would like to die for, you would like to support, you would like to demonstrate for. The only ones who are supplying the project are the last nationalists. They say, yeah, return back to sovereignty, uh, stop the European bureaucrats, and so on and so on. Right? And that kind of, you know, it's very troubling that the vote for Yogi, the vote for Kaczynski, to a large extent, not the vote of older people you would expect. This is a vote of younger people, very often educated. The generation which has the biggest opportunity in the history of that part of the world. Those young people can study any country they want, live in any country they want, work in any country they want, not as cast our mind, getting full right with all the benefits and everything, permissions, and so on. Yeah. This is the luckiest generation ever. No other had this kind of opportunities, and they say no. That's a very, uh, very troubling issue. Uh, now, okay, I'm going to discuss this. percentages 
those parties now changing everything. But there is this piece that 18% support of eligible voters and 37% of those who actually voted. This is a minority political party. And this is a minority political party who has the idea of democracy that whoever wins the election can do anything. Because it was a given, God given right by the people to run. So these are the minorities uh, really which are pushing these countries into a very dangerous situation. Now, when you ask people, this is a survey which was done three years ago. Right? This is a pure survey. How much do you like Europe? The two countries which like Europe the most are called none. Look at that. This is another funny story. But you know, those kind of people like what they see. When asked about handling of the economy, again, Poland is polls are thinking that EU is doing well. And Hungarians are very close to it. Right? So Poles, Germans, and Hungarians are thinking that EU is doing economically quite good. So those minorities imposing the new rule are really going against, uh, against the wishes and preferences of the majorities and of the population. Now, is the way out of that? And I think I want to read this. I think that the only way out for Poland and Hungary and potentially some other places is the strong from the European Union, which is able to control what's the rule of law and quality of democracy in the member states. And today, it looks very sad uh, that we may not have that kind of European Union which would prevent this kind of nationalistic revolution from the fact that it takes uh, in the state of Alright, so uh, let me end up on this, on this pessimistic level. <laughs> Uh, uh, perspective. 
I think the problem is uh, increasingly uh, not just with our part of Europe, with Central Eastern Europe, but with Europe as, as a whole. And it has to do with some of the things that you mentioned. During the Cold War, the Western part of Europe, or the West, if you call it, including the United States on the other side of the pond, were largely united in the defense of the values that we still invoke as our fundamental values by the threat of the totalitarian uh, system from, from the East, and that kept them uh, more or less uh, united and, uh, and aware, you know, keeping the eyes on the ball, as the Americans would say. After 1989, there was a residual task for, for them and for us, and that is the, to read the fruits of the victory and to bring our part of Europe back into the fold, and that was a mission for us. We called it back to Europe, for you, for, for everybody, and it was also a, a mission for the European Union and for NATO, the alignment of NATO, the alignment of the European Union, and that was more or less completed by 2004. And what next? And suddenly you see that uh, the eyes on the ball are no longer there, that, uh, you know, even speaking of some things that we thought we knew what they meant, like human rights, you know, you encounter completely upset debates about human rights, like the fundamental human right to broadband internet, or, you know, fundamental human right to an equal salary for everybody in the world, as uh, you know, in the referendum in Switzerland uh, two weeks ago, etc., etc., and and the sense of the direction and the sense of the mission is uh, is uh, is is largely lost, and the sense of the West as a geopolitical entity is also weakening by by the day because it's not just. EU is that is having problem the, the sense of transatlantic relationship that was very strong over the years is also much weaker today that prevents us from dealing some of the crisis in the around us in Syria and the Middle East and so on and so forth. So uh, that is uh, my worry that it's not just us that's in trouble. It may be us and the West. There's no question that uh, the, the troubles are in Europe. So elections in the US, you know, we live in despair. I mean, you know, people cannot believe what has happened. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, this may move in any possible way. I, I think, you know, I've already mentioned this to someone yesterday, uh, a friend of mine wrote this piece about the, you know, possible problems uh, in Europe, and it started with a joke, uh, saying uh, that President Trump, uh, together with Prime Minister Johnson, will congratulate Marina Le Pen for winning the presidency of France. Now, <laughs> half a year ago, this was completely ridiculous. Today, at least the first two, uh, not so so funny. Funny. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, that's the point, and, and of course you see the trouble not only in the West uh, uh, in broad sense, but you see this in Russia, you see trouble in China. Uh, so there is a moment in the world history where there is a return of turbulence uh, uh, of uh, quite amazing intensity uh, and uh, <coughs> return of conflicts of, uh, of various kinds, uh, which we thought behind us in the middle of South China Sea and everything we just don't care. I mean, you know, the, the Southeast Asia today it looks like Europe in the 1930s. You know, we are very busy thinking about what's going on in Europe and pay very little attention to what is going on in our lives. <coughs> the, the powder cap, uh, which may explode every second in China or, you know, newly authoritarian Chinese leader one city and city to city. So that's, that's point number one, right? That there is this across the board very turbulent uh, and, and uncertain uh, situation uh, which may, within which many things can go wrong uh, in different ways. Now, about the EU, for 
the last four decades, the EU project was an elite project. And people in the countries of the European Union really did not pay much attention. They were saying, well, you know, the Spanish people in Brussels measures bananas and, you know, those regulations, uh, how you know, we should do this or that. And this is completely irrelevant. Philippa Schmiedeko is a great world scientist. At a certain point, I um, said, well, you want to make European Union relevant? Let's decide. Let's let the Union decide taxation, benefits, healthcare, retirement. Then you will see everyone will pay attention to it. That's exactly what we have today. Yeah. Suddenly, people in Greece walk out. And said, bloody hell. Some bureaucrats in Brussels are cutting our benefits, are cutting our salaries, are cutting our pensions. Something is going terribly wrong. Right? So, so you know, you, you have that moment where people realize suddenly that EU matters and they don't like it. Yes. That's the paradox, you know, exactly the same that you know would or could bring the EU together are the same that are preventing France from getting together. Now, the second thing which, uh, uh, which uh, you know, I sort of hesitate to, to, to say that, uh, and I have to sort of, you know, make an introductory remarks. I spent my entire life uh, committed to democracy. Right? Since I was of your age in the college, you know, I was sacrificing whatever I could for my ideas and conditions about liberalism, pluralism, democracy. Okay. Saying that, I think that the idea of democratizing the European Union was a very misguided project. And some people who are strongly behind that acknowledge this today. They say, we struggle so much to give the European Parliament more power. Because we thought moment the European Parliament has more power, then people will say, yes, it's an important institution, we'll vote for it, we'll elect it. The European Parliament has the highest power today we ever had. The participation in European elections is the lowest in history. It's been going down every five years since 1980, the first European election. That's right, but, 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 but you know, the moment you know, the powers of the government started to accumulate, it went even, yeah. even harder. And then you have, of course, all the loony fringe parties running the European elections who would not have the support in, in, in regular elections. And you know, a big part of the parliament is a collection of completely strange people with you know, completely outlandish ideas. So you know, the idea of democratizing European Union through expansion of the rights uh, of the European Parliament, I, I think was a was a wrong idea. Now, these people who were advocating uh, expansion of rights of the Parliament, I say today, all right. So yeah, this didn't work. This didn't democratize European Union enough because the Commission is a problem. So Commission has to be a and if you know the population of Europe votes. Uh, you know, Christian Democrats as the minority in the parliament, those Christian Democrats should have the government, should have, you know, the European Commission and should pursue uh, the policies uh, they want, because they want the elections. Right? And I, I think this would be even bigger disaster if that would have happened than, than given, giving so much uh, power to the European Parliament. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there is something to be said about the EU as a lead project as a set of uh, uh, autonomous institutions which are taken out of cellular politics, uh, depoliticization, uh, um, you know, the way the central banks are. Technocratization? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, this is, this is one of the possibilities. I, I just put this on the table because I think, you know, this, the moment, as long as it was a technocratic project, it worked. I mean, the moment it started to be more forceful, democratize, and things were developing. But doesn't it, doesn't it illustrate <coughs> the, the Fukuyama's thesis from the origins of political order that in order to have a functioning state, 
you have to have uh, an element of choice, that's democracy, but a strong state with strong institutions, that's the bureaucracy and uh, uh, the technocracy behind it. And accountability. And I, I personally believe that the, the problem with the various uh, attempts to handle <coughs> with the European Union is that you increase the democratic element without increasing the accountability, or you increase the bureaucratic element without uh, you know, doing something for the institutions to be more accountable and so on and so forth. You know, by the way, you said that uh, you know, most people for a long time did not care about the European project. I, I have to say this here because we are in the Vassal Havel library. Uh, Vassal Havel, as a 16-year-old boy, living in a Stalinist, communist Czechoslovakia in the first months of 1953, in a letter to a friend wrote, uh, that was eight days after the signing of the agreements on the European Steel and Coal. So he wrote, look, this is where the new Europe is being born. You know, how did he arrive at that idea as a 16-year-old at that time in this place is, is a mystery to me. But he did, and, and he, he, he thought about the project for, for all his life, he supported the project very vehemently. But at the same time, you know, in his speeches and his writings, you know, he criticized the, the lack of identity, the lack of ethos, of uh, responsibility, so to speak. Responsibility was a big word for him. And, and I'm afraid that what we are experiencing in Europe today is a crisis of responsibility. That's right, and crisis of solidarity, yeah. uh, which is very much connected to it uh, as well. Um, you know, I, 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 I agree with uh, that I said, and it's a kind of duty of the and so on. The question is, uh, uh, should we treat uh, European Union as a state? Right? So there is a big discussion, has been for, for, for many years, about the uh, you know, democratic deficit. center has to your grass. In the center of Odessa, you will find more Porsches and receivers than in the center of Prague. So there's a total paradox yeah, which is not granted by the grass. <coughs> no way. Yeah. Um, the, not only there are, there is a, 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 a very rich upper class, but all restaurants, all, all bars are full with middle class people. And you ask yourself how is it possible with the salary of not even to a hundred euro, which tends to go down with the rule of four So uh, that's the situation. And this situation, I must say, is not reported in the Western media. Because it means that if you impose um, this four uh, shenko Ukraine to the south, you just, it, is, it is just as if you would impose to the Bohemian Czechs, yeah? uh, I don't know what, which type of language, uh, maybe the Slovak uh, language, yeah? and said so from now on, you guys in Charles University, you are going to take, have lectures in Slovak. Yeah? They will not be happy. Yeah? So why do you want to that art in the Crimea is the same? So why do, what, what do you do with democracy on that level? So in the Crimea, obviously 80 or 90 percent, I don't know exactly, uh, of the people said, okay, we don't want this for Central Ukraine, we are more Russian friendly, and uh, we are very happy that. 
belongs to us, Georgia belongs to us, and no one should dare really to uh, to, to otherwise. And, and you know, we are, as Obama said, you know, some time ago, we are living uh, in the 21st century. This is the 19th century. We don't want to have uh, dependent state buffer zones and all these other things. Um, now, that being said, uh, you uh, is trying to do something that then the refugee was, you know, and that's probably uh, is, uh, is a big mistake. So, you know, there's a lot of things coming into, uh, into play uh, when you think about how Europe should really think about the uh, European neighborhood and the kind of relationship uh, Europe should have with these neighborhoods. All right, we have time for maybe one last question, please. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Amitrek, I'm from the Association for International Affairs. Uh, and I, um, at first, I would like to thank you for a very inspiring lecture. It was very, very interesting, especially some of the points. Uh, but just the way you described transformation, transition, was very interesting for me because you mentioned that there are these uh, structural factors, you have some predispositions of the countries to perform better. But I mean, my question was, is um, when you look at individual cases, especially around the post Soviet space, for example, um, <coughs> and look at the graphs you showed us, you will find out that, for example, um, looking at Georgia or Ukraine, um, the situation is much more complicated than these simplistic graphs of uh, Freedom House or um, World Bank and others. Because especially the counter-revolution moved these countries, for example, on the rule of Saakashvili, much more forward, even though at the beginning they didn't really start off well with Shevardnadze and during the 1990s. It wasn't ideal, right? So I'm just wondering how do you deal with these um, these details on on the ground actually happening and kind of countering what you showed us uh, at otherwise very interesting um, presentation. Thank you. This is, this is a, a, a normal function uh, all of us who do social science yes. uh, every day. Right? You know, the social reality is a very <coughs> complicated. There's a lot of specificities uh, in places, uh, countries, and, and so on. And we really need to acknowledge that uh, uh, and not to try you know, to deny that this is not the case. But on the other hand, we sort of what we, what we long for is the Say something which uh, uh, applies to a little bit uh, broader things outside of very specific, uh, uh, you know, case uh, of a very specific country. You can say exactly the same thing about the regions within the countries, right? So <coughs> you know, we can push that that even more and say, okay, what are you talking about? You're talking about Poland and how to look at Poland and so on. No, I mean there are tremendous regions. This, you have different levels of economic development and so on, right? So but we are, you know, uh, have somehow no much of this problem saying Poland or this uh, Czech Republic, this country, this and so on. Uh, so so the, the, the real challenge is uh, you know, how to combine these things, how to be able to make some more general observations without sacrificing too much of the of the complexity of the university.
singing. And these are only ones for which the news have come to Harvard, and there may be many others, but they haven't been discovered. So, again, uh, Professor Eckers, thank you so much. I apologize.